All right, let's get started. Um, hi, everybody, and um, welcome to our webinar on spirit work in the science of collaboration with Michael Fullen and Mark Edwards. We're really glad that you're all here um, and happy Valentine's Day. Um, just a few reminders before we get started. Um, please submit your questions and feel free to interact with other participants in the chat box. Um, we, and make sure your chat is set to everyone as well. Um, they're going to be doing a Q&A at the very end. Um, so make sure and stay tuned and submit your questions. If you'd like to disable the closed captioning, you can click on CC Live Transcript at the bottom of the screen and click on Hide Subtitles. And then also this webinar is being recorded. Um, the recording and a certificate of the attendance will be set, sent um, out to, to your email in the next few days. So make sure you add info at k12.corwin.com to your email safe list to make sure you receive it. And then finally, we're gonna be giving away two copies of the book um, called Spirit Work and the Science of Collaboration at the end of the webinar. So make sure to stick around and see if you've won. Um, now I'm gonna pass it off to Tanya Gons, who's the Senior Acquisition Editor at Corwin. Welcome everyone. I am so excited to introduce uh, this webinar for the Spirit Work and the Science of Collaboration. I will begin by introducing the preeminent Michael Fullen, an author who needs little introduction in education spheres, but he is the author or co-author of over 30 books that primarily focus on achieving efficacy through uh, a systems focus. His ideas have transcended national boundaries and are, in, are embraced in Canada, the United States, England, and a number of other nations. His work consistently presents a complex yet compelling set of recommendations for a broad array of problems confronting schools and spirit work is no exception to this. In particular, I think he would argue that there is currently a sort of an Overton's window for what could happen uh, and a real breakthrough for what could happen in education these days. And lastly, but far from least, Michael is the global leadership director for new pedagogies for deep learning and continues to advise policymakers and local leaders around the world. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. And now uh, our second author, Mark Edwards. Uh, he is, like I said, the second author of tonight's featured work. Um, if any of you take the time to research Mark's work because you don't already know it, you'll find the same terms keep popping up over and over again to describe him. He's persistent, he's driven, he's creative, he's resourceful and all other things similar. Um, he was named the 2013 National Superintendent of the Year for his work in the Mooresville grade school district where President Obama came to visit one of his schools. He's a champion of public schools and public education and, and the role that technology can play to bolster student achievement. And he's also a really big music buff. So don't be surprised if a band shows up in the middle of tonight's <laughs> webinar. Um, with that, I, I gladly turn it over to these two experts to really get into the details of this uh, really tremendous and fantastic latest work from the both of them. Uh, thank you, Tanya, and uh, welcome everyone. We're going to take um, half an hour, 35 minutes to uh, set the stage and then look forward to a lot of interaction. Uh, that is, uh, as someone myself who uh, has the mantra of uh, all of our best ideas come from working with practitioners closely, 80% of our best ideas. So that's why I like Mark so much. We go back, uh, we did a book uh, a few years ago, but he represents the best of practice and the most advanced things. And when he came to me, I guess it was about 18 months ago saying, look, there's a book we need to do about what's happening in some districts that are going way beyond what is possible even seems possible. And we should look at them and characterize them. And so I got into that and we delved into these eight districts. We'll uh, comment on them in a few minutes. And uh, it really was a gold mine of a group of districts that were, I'm going to say, anticipating the future, uh, nailing the past, the good past. And uh, it, this is really a huge transitional time for learning, as you know. So I'm going to say a few words about positioning it that way. Then Mark and I will go back and forth as we uh, talk about these eight districts and the phenomenon that we're representing. 
I do a lot of work, as uh, as, as Tanya said, about uh, whole system change. It's all practically based. How do you do it? We've got massive involvement in California right now, which has a, a lot of uh, potential, a lot of issues. But the way I would put it is that I think the immediate future is up for grabs. And I have actually in um, February 23rd, I have an op-ed coming out in Ed Week called Six Reasons for Being Optimistic About Learning in 2022. So I can't say those now because it's embargoed, so to speak, till the 23rd. But I could have written um, uh, a convincing uh, op-ed, uh, Six Reasons to Be Pessimistic About uh, Prospects for Change in Education and Society in 2022. And I really do mean it's up, it's up for grabs. It's going to depend on the action that we and others who are on this call are actually going to take to, I, I'm going to say, to uh, change the future, to reduce, re, reverse the negative tra, tra, you know, projection that's going on now. And it really could be horrible. You know, you can sense the horribleness of it, but it also can be shaped. And this is where this book, as it turns out, Mark's idea was to do the book, is incredibly timely. I can't believe in advance how he knew that it's going to be as timely as it is. So uh, let's, let's uh, get into it. Uh, we did uh, focus on eight districts in the U.S. that uh, uh, Mark and the network had identified. These were districts. We're going to comment very briefly on each of the eight that were uh, doing unusual um, things to get at uh, deeper learning in times where that shouldn't have been quite so possible, but they were, they were doing that. They did it, they anticipated before, before, the, before COVID, and they, they, they proved one other thing about COVID. Those districts that had their act together prior to COVID did the best at coping with COVID and actually, actually going beyond it. If you didn't have your act together before COVID, you were just sitting ducks. Uh, this was uh, uh, that all the, all the negative things that could have happened do happen if you weren't already bending in the right, uh, in the right direction. So I wanna say then about, uh, about this, I really do fundamentally mean the world is in a precarious state. And you can just take two major dimensions. One is physical, the other is social. The physical dimension is climate and all of the things that are collapsing around that. The social dimension is equity, gaps between the rich and the poor, that uh, the, uh, the social trust, if you just take uh, Putnam's uh, study on upswing, they cited the data that shows in the 60s, the percentage of uh, uh, population that said, they trust groups in society was around 65%. Now it's around, I don't know, 30% and falling, plummeting even. So this is, uh, the societal con con context is really collapsing. Uh, uh, on the other hand, some of the work that this represents in the eight districts and the, uh, I'm gonna say the, uh, the prospects uh, we have in deep learning, which we call engage the world, change the world, young people as agents of change, of learned um, people who can make a difference, that this is really real time now. We used to think about, okay, let's improve education because it will improve society in the future. Now I say improve education because it'll improve society today. And if we don't do it today or tomorrow, we are uh, in real trouble. So I know that's a big uh, context. I, I thank Mark for anticipating, I guess, I don't know whether he would have articulated it this way, 18 months ago when we first started this, but he really did anticipate the precarious nature of the future. And that's, uh, that's how we got to do what we did. So we're gonna follow a sequence of giving you a, a kind of profile of what we did. That the book is called Spirit Work and the Science of Collaboration. Spirit work is a, uh, is a powerful term altogether. Uh, uh, I used to call it moral purpose. And moral purpose is, you know, great. But there's something unusual about the moral purpose in 2022 that has the feeling of we're really in evolutionary terms in real time about the future of humanity. 
I hate, I don't like to uh, exaggerate, and this is not an exaggeration. This is about the future of humanity. And somehow these districts were anticipating this in their local way by doing phenomenal commitment to the moral purpose, which we have called spirit work, and we'll explain that. They did not, the eight districts did not use the concept spirit work, but as soon as we introduced it, they said, that's exactly what we're doing. We didn't have to sell it. We just called it. And they said, yeah, this is right, like, this is us. So you have this kind of uh, phenomenal coincidence, <coughs> sorry, coincidence where the uh, spirit work, which is defined as the very deep appreciation of humanity, the very commitment to young people, especially, but also to people of all ages and thinking of education as the potential vehicle for resurrecting uh, humanity from where, where it has evolved in society. So we think the new education and I, I, myself, we pursue it in deep learning. We think that now education is shifting from being on the receiving end of a bad society to being on the proactive end of creating a better society. The, the amount of things that we're now addressing, school things and non-school things, have increased the agenda. It is about equity. It's about things that are not just learning in the narrow sense, but uh, much more widely. And that's what I think what we've been able to capture in an anticipated way by these uh, districts that were ahead of the curve. We're uh, going to be now, I think, examples of uh, where things should happen. But I want to underscore that this is precarious. This is a troubled time that could go south, that we could have the doomsday scenario just as well as we could have the uplifting scenario, which is the one that not only do we prefer it, but we're trying to cause it to happen. So I want to say then, I'll turn it over to Mark in a, in a couple of minutes, that uh, what we mean by spirit work is the deep love of humanity, not just students, that include students, not just parents, not just community, the deep love of humanity as it plays itself out with uh, educational. It has a lot in common, as it turns out, as you might speculate, with indigenous communities. Uh, in Canada, we see the connection. In the US, with the tribes, there are the connection. But it also has a lot in common with, I would say, what uh, non-indigenous people have been seeking uh, in uh, in where you know why are we here on this earth? What is humanity? So it's a convergence of what indigenous people already knew, and what they're trying to recapture now. What we think we should have appreciated from them but didn't, and what humanity itself represents. And all of this is wrapped up into the eight cases. So I start with the first half of the concept. Uh, I'm going to ask my, uh, Mark in about sixty seconds to comment on his version of the spirit work and, uh, and also the fantastic connection he made with Meg Wheatley, uh, who is, uh, was ahead of us, all of us on this concept, but she jumped uh, on the possibility of doing, <clears throat> excuse me, the forward for the book. So Mark, over to you from some comments on spirit work and the connection to Meg Wheatley. Thanks, Michael. And I want to say happy Valentine's to everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, you know, one of the things that we hear from kindergarten is that hold hands and stick together. And, and I think it's, it's really more, more important than ever that we're doing exactly that, that we are holding hands and sticking together. And what Margaret Wheatley has been a huge influence on school leaders for years. She worked uh, quite a bit in several continents, but she worked in South Africa for quite a while and she worked with tribal leaders and she she learned about the term Ubuntu. And that term, which means being fully human, or it means that you're only, you only exist through the eyes of other. So one of the things that in talking to, and we had a chance to talk to Margaret and, and look at her work and other work is that we thought deeply about what needs to be done, what can be done to help school leaders, teachers, parents, communities, to find a way to get through all this. Well, as we started talking about spirit work, one of the things I thought of, of in my years as a superintendent and principal 
Um, I've really admired Michael's work for years. Six Secrets was a book that we used in a district that I was working in is really kind of a foundational piece for our philosophy. And of course, I've, I've looked at Michael's work on school culture. We've done some work on school culture. This is bigger than school culture. Spirit work is beyond what I call associative work or work that's similar. As spirit work, we're talking about a very developed, intentional, lasting, long-term focus on creating a sense of lift for every student, for everyone every day. And, and when you look at what, what do we mean by that? Creating a culture and creating conditions where there's trust, love, hope, conversations, joy, happiness, and that people work on it every day. It's not just something that just happens. And, and we really believe that students are in desperate need for nurturance. Nurturance with this sense of we, we will all help lift each other through this. So a lot of it comes down to nothing new, but a sense of deliberate care and putting that as a priority. Teachers do much better in a loving environment. Students do much better in a loving environment and communities do much better in a loving environment. So the spirit work is about that intentional focus on creating that spirit that lifts everyone every day. Now I'll flip it back over to Michael to talk about the collaborative science and getting into that deep sense beyond the associative work of collaboration, but into the deep work of collaboration. Sorry, back to me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, so Andy uh, Hargraves and myself have looked at collaboration for a number of years. And uh, we have come actually to have a balanced view to say that collaboration is not necessarily automatically good. You can collaborate to do the wrong things. You can collaborate to do nothing. So there's a certain way in which collaboration has to be situated. And the best way of guaranteeing it that it's likely to be on the same, the right track is to link it to uh, uh, spirit work. There has got a substance, it's got a combination and never, in fact, when you read the book, uh, Meg Wheatley in the foreword said, well, I don't think of collaboration as separate from uh, spirit work. It's actually fused, it's the same thing. And that, that, is, uh, that is correct. So uh, now I also wanna say that uh, what was theoretical before, theoretical, and oh yeah, we should have more collaboration, we should have more uh, moral purpose or spirit work is now in real time essential. We will not survive if we do not transform the educational system to be uh, this effective in what we're able to do. So I want to uh, say about science of collaboration, it only means uh, something if it's part and parcel of the work. And that's what we have in the eight districts that they have uh, connected those two. And we have a lot of uh, new ideas about how this can connect, how joint determination, how a phrase that we've developed in a collaboration called contextual literacy. It's a fancy word for saying contextual literacy are leaders who understand the context or the culture in which they work. And that's why they're successful. So we're going to say, uh, a few words about, we have eight districts. Uh, Mark's gonna start with uh, two of these, uh, Ithaca with Luvelle uh, uh, Brown and with Lynn Moody from uh, Rowan Salisbury. So we'd, we'd like to go back and forth just to give you a flavor of the eight superintendents. And they weren't all connected to each other. These were spontaneous uh, examples that were on the same track. And that these are actually people who wanna re interact with each other but uh, but they are uh, they're special, but they're not. I wouldn't say they're not extremely rare. It's fact we know a lot of potential superintendents and other leaders who want to be like this, who are like this. So, Mark, over to you about uh, Ithaca and about uh, Rowan Salisbury. Sure, and I, you know one of the things as you can see across your screen, the eight district leaders. Now, I will mention that uh, a couple of these leaders have retired or moved on to other work. 
Um, but I'll start off with Dr. Brown, Louvelle Brown at Ithaca, New York. And, and Louvelle has been in Ithaca now for over a decade. Uh, it's a district of five to 6,000 students. And when Louvelle first started the work in Ithaca, he started off by talking about love, talking about the importance that in school systems with children and teachers, that there's a foundation of love and care. And, and he, he, he stuck with it. He also, Dr. Brown talked a lot about the importance of listening to students and engaging in continuous conversation and not just periodically or occasionally or on fun Fridays or something, but a, but a constant sense of if we know each other, if we engage with each other, if we engage with students, we'll do a better job. So they've worked very, very focused on that for years and have built this sense of spirit and trust. One of the stories from Ithaca that I think is very compelling, a few years ago, through a lot of work from a lot of school leaders, they decided to change board policy that required students to be on IEP planning committees, that they were participants and, and had a vote and had a voice. And they started this process. And one of the first students, when they finished, and she was a young lady, I believe they mentioned she was around a, a freshman in high school, but they said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, you know, I really like this. I think it's a good idea, but I'm concerned that all the meetings that you guys had over the years, that I wasn't involved. And, and you think about the power of that learning, that she had this innate sense of my voice needed to be heard, and it's good that it is now. So again, a message about the power of learning with students and from students. Now, I'll move on to, to Roanne Salisbury, Dr. Lynn Moody, who uh, we've known each other for years, so have known Dr. Brown, but we worked side by side in North Carolina for several years. And in Roanne Salisbury, they studied a lot of the work of Michael, but they focused a lot on intentional, deliberative work on learning from others, not just collaborating for collaborate, but really being focused on learning from other leaders and other districts, from other teachers, and built a lot of process, a lot of effort and energy on collaborative focus for learning, and really a lot of dedicated resources to support teachers at every level. Now, another neat story that came from Roa and Salisbury, part of their focus has been on preparing students for life. And one story that Dr. Moody shared was a young man who had been working a worked in a work study program. He was a student who had special needs and he had worked in this program. He worked with some maintenance workers and some custodians and they had encouraged him. And he, he graduated from school and, and Dr. Moody said it was it was one of these situations where it took a lot of people to help encourage him to get through. And when he finished, his principal recommended that he be hired as a custodian in the school. And so he immediately went to work and he saw Dr. Moody one day and she had met him. And he was so proud to come back to the district and work in the district. And she invited him to an employee focus group. And he came to the group. He was very proud of it. And he sat down and she, he told Dr. Moody that he had gone to the Goodwill store and had bought a new suit just to be a part of this meeting. But in the meeting, he raised his hand. And he said, you know, one of the things I've just started working here, but one of the things I noticed is that the maintenance workers have these nice shirts, but the custodians don't have them. And the custodians need shirts like that, too, so that we can be a team. And, you know, the room agreed and they agreed to it. He also mentioned they needed steel toed boots and they worked out provisions to support that. And part of that, the power of that collaborative spirit work is a sense of, we are teaching students and we are learning from students at the same time. Now I'm gonna flip it back over to Michael for some really, really exciting work about some other great leaders in Virginia and then in Kentucky. Okay, so these schools are, uh, these districts are of different sizes with two that Mark just talked about. Uh, uh, Ithaca has 12 schools, uh, Rowan Salisbury has 37. We're gonna to switch to Virginia Beach, 86 schools and uh, Jefferson County, 150 schools. And these, uh, these are variations on the theme. So if we could take Virginia Beach, uh, Aaron Spence is the superintendent. If you look at what they, these have, uh, I, guess, I guess I wanna say it this way, that a lot of people have talked about moral purpose or even spirit work and they put it in the vision, but they haven't done it operationally in the implementation of the work. 
So if you look at uh, Aaron Spence's uh, core values that he has for the district, they have for the district, be cared for emotionally, to learn every day to be loved. Literally, that's what it says. But then they start to model it by uh, having the frequent co collaboration. The best example of this is when COVID came, and this is again a finding we've had elsewhere, when districts had collaboration and COVID came along, the districts with collaboration did a better job of coping with it. If they weren't collaborative to first, in the first place, they were sitting ducks or whatever uh, image you want to use. So what they did was intensify the collaboration. They were working seven days a week. They expanded their core group from 12 to 35. And so everybody got involved, what I call in nuance, uh, joint determination. So the really great success, a really great reaction. So that's uh, Aaron Spence in Virginia Beach. And then Marty uh, Polio in, in Jefferson County. This is a fantastic story, actually, uh, also. Uh, Marty Polio was uh, one of the principals at the secondary school. It's a big district, 150 schools. And they, had, uh, they were on the state watch list to be taken over when he was school principal. And they, had, they, had fi they fired the previous superintendent. They were seeking to take it over. And they appointed Marty as the, uh, as the superintendent. And he was starting in the hole. This was a bad uh, a district that had all kinds of problems around it. He said almost on his first meeting, we have uh, 150 schools. We have 150 independent contractors. We don't have a system. And so uh, what he did, and this is uh, uh, a lot of the things I know about change, you focus on a small number of things and you do them especially well. So that's what I wanna highlight here. With discussion with a lot of people, they said, we're going to, we're going to have three skills or three goals, positive climate, one theme, second theme, racial equality, and third theme, really a breakthrough innovation, a backpack of skills. I'll say something about that in a moment. So he, he, he had these established and then they began to implement things, but I especially like the backpack of skills because it relates to our, uh, to our deep learning uh, work that we do uh, in other jurisdictions that he said that he, he actually in his doctorate, he, was, he had a PhD in his doctorate, he concluded, and this is, I'm quoting him now, is that the worst thing that ever happened to American education was standardized test and focus on a small number of punitive uh, uh, performance goals, uh, literacy, numeracy. It's not that there's wrong with that, it's when you do it punitively, that's a problem. So he said, we've got to broaden this out in their backpack of skills, persistence and resilience. These are for students, communication, collaboration, innovation, globally and culturally competent citizens. So now the, uh, the schools, the students, are developing these themes, they do these in projects, and then they present, present in grades five, eight, and 12, what they know to a panel of teachers, the whole place came alive. So you can read about it, it's fantastic. And so uh, this, is, this is innovative work way ahead of its time. And now we're seeing this in other places with our deep learning. So I'm gonna now uh, flip back to, uh, uh, to Mark about uh, Shelby County and Highline District with a couple of other great, leadership, great systems at work. Thanks, Michael. You know, I'm, I'm particularly proud. I, I grew up in Tennessee and I'm from Tennessee, and I'm particularly proud of, of Dr. Joris Ray and, and the Memphis Shelby County Schools. And that's a, a new, that's a recent change. For years, the district was Memphis City Schools, and then it became Shelby County Schools, and now it's returned back to Memphis Shelby County Schools. But Dr. Ray, Joris Ray is a homegrown product, grew up, went to school, in Memphis, and and when we first started corresponding and working and communicating, you just like everyone that's participating uh, in, in the webinar today, everyone has gone through just dramatic change and and some really challenging times. Every single district that we've talked about, we're we're focusing on the great work, but they've all been through just gut wrenching uh, challenges, just like you. Dr. Ray um, is leading a district. There's over 112,000 students, 150, 175 schools. And early in the pandemic, there were huge needs, just like in, like in every district. But they were trying to deploy devices to every student, trying to make sure families had essential needs. 
And one of the things that, that Memphis Shelby County Schools, they've done such a great job of spirit work is reaching out to families, constantly working out to families to make sure that the family is being cared for just like the students. Now, about a year ago or a little over a year ago, there was a huge, huge uh, kind of a showdown in Memphis. Uh, if you know anything about Memphis, it's a, it's a city that has great pride in their athletic programs and sports. It's a, it's a hotbed for high school sports in the United States. And they were trying to decide whether they could have athletics or not with COVID. And there were a lot of challenges going on with it. And ultimately, Dr. Ray and his team made the decision, along with the school board, that it just was not safe to engage in sports. And they called a press conference and had a big meeting. And it was tense. It was emotional. And, and Dr. Ray said, we, it, we're going to do what's best for students and we cannot have sports. We're going to have to, we're going to have to conclude the seasons. And there was a lot of mo emotion and, and anger and tension. And somebody asked Dr. Ray, why are you doing this? And, and Dr. Ray stepped to the mic and he said, I've loved Memphis sports my entire life, but I love Memphis students more. And I think that was that type of spirit message and to tell you the truth, it had a calming effect because people knew that that Joris was talking from his heart when he said that. Now, in another situation, another really powerful story, Dr. Ray and the team in Memphis, as they were trying to figure out how to deploy devices, over 100,000 devices to find connectivity, to try to provide other resources for students, one of the big challenges was trying to get the community to wrap their heads around this and get it done. And they engaged in a great collaborative process with school system employees and leaders, public employees, elected leaders, corporate leaders, and, and really thrashed through this. And as Dr. Ray says, it got noisy, but we were working through it. And the final decision, there was a meeting had come up to make the final decision on exactly what to do and the recommendation was to provide a device to every student. And one of the elected leaders who, who had questioned a lot of the efforts but made the comment to Dr. Ray, are you willing to put your job on the line to do this? And Dr. Ray again with calmness said, I will put my line on the job for our students every day. And again, I think in, in times of need, that's when you see leaders step up. And, and when you see communities say, we're going to pull together and we're going to get this done. And that affirming message and using that collaborative process, that was several months in the works. So it wasn't just, it was something that took a lot of time and energy. But again, great spirit work going on in Memphis, Shelby County, and a real sense of advocacy for every student and every family. And I think lots of times when we talk about students, if we don't understand students and families, we're missing. And that's a good segue into the Highline School District outside of Seattle, Washington, where Susan Enfield is a superintendent and again has been superintendent there for about 10 years. It's a district of about 20,000 students and Dr. Enfield has done some great work. And you can't, when you talk to Susan, you can't help but get excited from hearing her talk about their work in Highline. And one of the things that just stands out in the district is the Highline Promise. And I can recall the first time I heard Susan tell me about the promise. And she said, the promise is about knowing every student by their name and not just calling their name, but knowing them by their name. The other is knowing every student by their needs, knowing students for what they need. And the third promise is knowing every student for their strengths. Now you think, well, that, that sounds pretty simple. Know their name, know their strengths, know their needs, but it's not that simple. It's that sense of having that promise to every student so that it's fulfilled. And one of the ways they did that in Highline, and it didn't, none of this just happens. I know when Michael and I are talking about this, all of these leaders have worked steadfastly for years, months, hours, days, weeks, pulling this through and getting things done. But one of the things that Dr. Anfield and the team in Highline did, they assigned every employee to work with a student so that there was a particular sense of connectivity with that student. And Susan said it didn't, didn't just happen. People were saying, oh, that's great. Give us another, something else to do. But over time, it took hold and people saw the value 
of the connectivity. Now, one of the stories that exemplifies that great spirit work in Highline, Susan and a principal were visiting an elementary school last spring and they walked into the class and they saw a little girl with her head down and she was asleep. And so Susan, the principal, asked her to come outside. They wanted to, wanted to know if they could do anything to help her. And they said, is everything OK? And she said that there were a lot of people living where she lived and she was just sleepy and 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 wasn't was would be OK. But anyway, Susan got to know her and started mentoring her. And later on, she asked her at one point, said, what's your what's one of your favorite things in the whole world? And she said, chicken teriyaki is one of my favorite things in the whole world world. And the next time Susan went to see her at the school, they had chicken teriyaki. And a little bit later on that spring, Susan called up the principal to check and see how the little girl was do, doing. And the principal said, well, she's, she's, we've lost track of her. She's no longer living where she is. We, she's out of the district. We're trying to find her. And Susan insisted, said, well, we need to find her and track her down and find out what's happening if she's okay. And the principal did some good work, tracked her, found her. She was in another district and they found out where, she, where they were living. They went to see her and she was living in a hotel room with several family members. And they brought some food, some clothing, uh, other things to the family, just to, as a sense of, you know, we want you to know we care about you, we're thinking about you. And of course they brought enough chicken teriyaki for everybody. And as, the, as Susan said, as they drove off, the little girl smiled and said, this has been such a great day. And I think lots of times we can lose a sense of how the power of that connection, both from collaborative process and spirit work. But again, hearing about these stories to inspire us, to help us to know that, yes, we can do this. And yes, we can find the answers. And the answers are in schools like San Ramon Valley and Chula Vista. And Michael's going to talk to us about some of the great work of Dr. John Malloy and Dr. Francisco Escobedo. Michael? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I, I noticed a couple of notes here that said, Mark, your camera's not on. So when we come back, uh, when Mark talks again, you'll see his beautiful face. So I'm sure you'll flip it on. Uh, and the last two, the pair, uh, John Malloy, interesting example, really uh, like phenomenal, actually. I know John very well, because up until about a year ago, district school board which has 500 schools it's mega so he was there in, um, in in that role and he moved to California and became superintendent uh, 14 months ago or whatever at San Ramon Valley which has about 38 schools so imagine this 500 schools 38 different countries different culture and it's a high performing district so you'll see the uh, I hope you'll read the case study because what has happened in a high performing district, not a high equity and equity one, which we have lots of that, is that you have to motivate people not to rest on their laurels because it's not gonna work out. So he, I uh, work closely with him now, has been working all during COVID to reestablish a mission that includes going into deeper learning beyond what they were. So that'll be a very interesting evolution right now uh, as as we are working in California, actually. And then finally, the district Chula Vista, it's in California. It has, uh, it's, a, it's really a phenomenal story. The, uh, the superintendent, Francesco, is uh, Escobedo. He did, he's done some great things with community development tied into uh, the school development. And this is radical. And I would just wanna focus it because we're actually working on it now. Here's the proposition. You change the non-school factors, including reduction of poverty, so students can be more successful in learning. And that's what we're doing right now in our team in San Diego County, which has 42 districts. One of those districts is uh, Chula Vista. And the proposition is, can you in the next three years reduce poverty as measured by free and reduced lunch and other kinds of inequity aspects and increase learning in a, under, under conditions? Because if you can't do the non-school part, you won't be successful at the school part. This is revolutionary. This is exciting. And it's building upon the work that we're seeing from, uh, from these, uh, these eight case studies. So I would say the eight case studies 
they're not normal. I mean, they're they're kind of you know possible because they're there, but they're they're harbingers of the immediate future, and the immediate future in learning is going to be radic has to be radically different from what we've had. This is not school as usual. This is school about engage the world, change the world, and so uh, we're going to stop about there. Uh, we can talk about the future implications but I'd rather do that in the context of the question. So let's turn it over to the hosts and we'll see in this last 20 minutes, uh, what kinds of questions or observations you have to, uh, to push us further, push all of us further into the future. Hi, uh, Michael, yeah, we don't have any questions yet. So if you wanted to keep going um, and we'll see what comes in. We can keep yeah. going forever probably, but... Uh, Let's prompt uh, people because they, they, they can ask these questions in the chat box. Uh, let, let us, uh, I'm gonna turn it back to Mark in a couple of minutes about what's next. Uh, we have the, uh, the AASA uh, uh, conferences in Nashville next weekend. There are 4,000 superintendents in, in attendance. They are uh, open, I, I'm gonna say to, uh, first of all, they're not clear about what should be the future. Let me be clear about this. Even though our, we have a lot of case studies, it's actually not very clear what to do actually in the immediate future. There's a lot of choices, depends a lot on local context. There's, uh, there's huge things up for grabs. So when I, I do my uh, op-ed on February 23rd, I'm gonna release a number of slides that talk about how can we shape the future by participating in real terms to develop that. But please do ask us questions or make observations and challenge us about where we are. We consider this book, I consider it, it's kind of, uh, I don't, I, I can say it's almost luck that we did it in a timely fashion because it was ahead of its time when we started it. Uh, but I think there's something uh, mysterious going on and Mark has that habit of anticipating the future and that's what we've been able to capture. Not the future solution, but the future stimulation to the lines of direction, which should be the solution. So I hope we'll have some uh, questions and uh, we'll go back and forth between Mark and myself about the next stages of change uh, if we don't have questions. And, and if we do have questions, you'll stimulate us to do that with more focus. So let me uh, jump in. Over. Yep. Let me jump in, Michael. I see it. I'm looking at the chat and see some good, some good questions that have come in. One from Brian McDonald and, and asking how, how can we find like-minded people? And I said, doing exactly what you're doing right now and connecting. And I think one of the things that as school leaders that, and this is something that um, in Roanne Salisbury, they expressed as part of the of requirements for leaders. It's not just about doing what you do in your immediate work. It's what you do in the broader context. So, connecting. You know, one of the other uh, one of the other questions that came through was about were there any commonalities in the leaders? And I, I would tell you there was one, there was multiple commonalities, but also variations. But one of the things I think was so impressive is that every one of these leaders would not hesitate to talk about the emotional uh, concepts around spirit and talk about love and hope and faith and, and trust. You know, when I was first talking to John Malloy, he said, you know, it, it's everything to be known. You think about something so simple, it is everything to be known, but think about how many students in the U.S. every single day or in Canada or in Australia or wherever our audience is today, where they don't feel known. They don't feel that. And you know, if you look at the, uh, the trend date, it is scary. When you see how many children today feel that they have deep, deep emotional trouble, but we know what to do. We hold hands and we stick together. And I wanna share uh, as we continue looking at some other questions. I think one of the things that um, we've learned in, in the work with the districts is that we see great examples in these districts and you see them all around the country. And what we have to do is lift it up, lift together. You know, I'll share this story uh, a few years ago in Mooresville, North Carolina. I do think this is a real powerful way to think about this. Um, we were having a session where, at, you know, at every, every year we have the end of the year senior projects and 
the, the students come in and this was a group of all the students were special needs students and it, and it's a big deal, but it's also takes a lot of work and the students get up and do a presentation in front of their peers and some parents and uh, students have been doing this. It's not a big gathering, but there was a young man. Um, he got up and his teacher and they had the, the projector ready to do the PowerPoint and he got ready to do it. And uh, but he didn't say anything. He just stood there. And then another student got up and, and put his hand on the young man's shoulder. And then the young man began talking. And he said, I did my senior project on how to be a custodian. And I worked with the Davidson University as a custodian. And the custodians are here today, here to see me. And they taught me three important things about how to be a custodian. One, you need a sense of humor. Two, you need to work hard and three you need to learn to work with other people and everyone in that room that day uh, learned several things but one of the most powerful things was they saw that spirit work of the young man's hand going on the shoulder of the other young man and then they th saw that science of collaboration with the connection with others and i think that as we keep seeing these examples and we share and we talk about it and here's what I would bet. I would bet that out of the audience today, there are dozens and dozens of stories that we need to tell and lift up and focus on as we build that spirit work and that collaboration. And Michael, I see several other questions that are popping up. And I know that one of the things, Michael, that through this that we've talked about and you've talked about too, is that this is not work for the weak of heart. <laughs> and we don't want we don't want to we don't want people to we don't need to add any more sense of dread or fear. But I really do believe the stakes are high. But I'm I'm filled with I'm filled with hope because of seeing the work that leaders are doing and the, the work that students are doing. And Michael, one of the things that I think in studying the deep deep learning, we know that students learn best together. And this is one of the deep learnings. They learn better together. Okay, let me pick it up. Um, there, there's one question about when the op-ed is coming and where can we get it. It's coming out by Ed Week, Education Week, on February 23rd. So it'll be easily accessible there. Uh, the, now there's another question about uh, what did Chula Vista do to link to the community? <clears throat> I'll tell you something about something that's the most exciting thing I'm part of right now which is we have just partnered with San Diego County. Chula Vista is in San Diego County. San Diego County has 42 districts. That's how counties are organized in California. They have established a goal that we're part of being committed to, that they are going to move uh, from their current situation where 50% of their 500,000 students are on uh, free and reduced lunch, a proxy for poverty. And they're going to change that 50% over the next three months, three, three years, three months is ridiculous, but three years, uh, to 35%. This is about 75,000 students. So this is this is the new challenge. Take the non-school factors, equity, uh, shelter, poverty, uh, food, all those non-school factors, which Shula Vista actually did quite well. Add the new learning from deep learning that Mark just referred to, which is students as agents of change and the deep pedagogy, the new science of learning and development in our own work. And I see Jean Clinton's uh, uh, question here or comment. Jean Clinton is a child psychiatrist and a neuroscientist as part of our team in Toronto. And she says, well, what about the well-being of people taking care of themselves? This is part of it. So. I'm going to say that this next three years is absolutely crucial that we not just do improve literacy and numeracy, that too, but we actually tackle the societal uh, factors and the learning factors and make it a combination. That's where this is leading. And these eight districts have been indicators of some of that, but now we're the radical change we're going to see or need in the next three years, especially, are absolutely up for grabs. And we want, we need a lot of takers. And we're so excited by being part of the San Diego uh, County 
aspirations in a lot, lot of other parts of California, and I'm sure there are other places in in the country as well. That this is this is not business as usual. Uh, all we've done is uncover some of the exceptions. What they point to are exceptions, and they say even we were exceptions, but the new version has to be even more radical. And that's what I want. I'm pushing this. You can see I'm excited. I'm pushing it because I can taste it, because I can see partners who want to do it, because we really can do some of it. And so this is big. This is necessary. This is the immediate future. And, you know, Michael, one of the things that um, and I, there's several good questions popping up, a couple about, you know, how do you work with school boards? And I think you do it like you do with all that work you started. You start that work, you start those discussions and that dialogue. And I know um, in working with some of these districts, they engaged with board talking about, and they weren't saying, let's talk about spirit work, or they weren't saying, let's, they, they were talking about the work that they were doing, whether it was the Backpack for Life program or, or in, in uh, Chula Vista, where they uh, set, set up five different family community centers. And, you know, part of it is what does every community need? And one of the things that we learned from Michael's work earlier with his book, Nuance, is that part of the part of the work of leaders is to look at the local nuance and the type of spirit work that's needed and the type of collaborative work. But we see growing evidence, and these are these are eight districts, but I would imagine if you had a chance to sit down with each of these leaders, they could name eight other districts and that those eight could name that are all putting this together. So I think part of it is you start the work just like these districts did. John Malloy came in and did some great work right in the middle of the pandemic by saying, let's build the community, let's talk about it. So I think it starts with taking those steps, reaching out, connecting, communicating, and most importantly, believing. You know, as educators, if we don't find a deep, deep sense of belief, who will? And we have to find it. We can find it. Each of these leaders demonstrate it every day. And I have to say this several times this year when they were, each of these leaders were under some real duress. I was amazed at their stamina of spirit and how they just kept saying, we'll, we'll, we'll make it through. And it's, it's impossible not to be motivated when you're around people that are so motivating. So if we all lift, we're all lifted. And that's what the message is. Okay, two more points. I'm picking up on the questions that we're seeing in the chat. Uh, one is about school boards. And uh, uh, I did a book a year and a half ago with Davis Campbell, who was the uh, executive director in California of the School Boards Association for about 21 years. <clears throat> and our book is called Core Governance. And we, uh, we set out there uh, actually, the sad story that a lot of superintendents say, my board is great because they don't bother me. They let me alone. That's the, more, that's the most damning thing I could think of. But then we have a lot of stories about how boards and the superintendent work together. And we have in there 10 tips for trustees, 10 tips for, uh, for uh, uh, superintendents about how to do this. And in, in one sense, the theme is politics is what you is what happens when you try to get elected and governance is what happens in between election. Unfortunately, we have politics all the way through instead of governance. So you'll see in that book, some, uh, some statements on that. And then I'm just looking at uh, something from Christine Bean, a teacher at Golfstown High School in New Hampshire, which our principal is hiring along the lines that we're talking about here. You have to combine the quality of learning in the quality of human beings in terms of the of the this is really the spirit of collaboration uh, uh, and this and the, the the spirit of work is that it's the caring well-being developmental side that is the foundation of this success and it's a precondition for quality learning they've got to go together in our newest work we're putting them that much together coexisting feeding on each other making it happen in combination. If you go for well-being and SEL and you fail to go deep into learning, you will fail. If you go learning and you fail on, you don't pay attention to the well-being, you'll also have a half of a solution. Well-being and learning go together. Equity is part of that uh, combination. 
And we can, we are defining it now. You can see what it looks like. We're trying to make it happen. We have a deep learning network uh, in 10 different countries actually with a couple of thousand schools where we're learning together how to implement this work. And it's exciting, it's the future and there's no time to be wasted to actually get going and doing this. It's learning from practice but it's learning from practice that moves us to the future faster than the future can be evolving on its own, which will be negative if we don't be proactive. You know, Michael, one of the, th I know we're, I see some, some other comments and a lot of the things, you know, have, uh, related to if, if you have individuals who don't believe this, well, I would imagine you can mm -hmm. go to any, uh, district in the country and you'll find individuals who say, well, I, I don't, I don't like this, or I don't think this is right. But what I would also say that if you look at a composite of leaders around the country, and these are eight, but there are dozens in other countries, I, I think that there's great evidence that leaders that lead with kindness, that care, that just like uh, the comments from Gosstown High School in New Hampshire, saying our principal only wants to hire people who have this kind, considerate heart. And I, and I really think that's that's very reasonable because if you think about this, if we don't have this sense of efficacy and advocacy for each other and for children, and you know, I think about the teachers and the bus drivers and the custodians and the child nutrition workers and all of the staff members that all need a big dose of nurturance. And I think as we go forward, how we get through these troubled times, it's through sticking together, through that nurturance, through that belief. And I do think that Michael and I, through this work, I think this idea of spirit work and that science, the science of collaboration are a two tools coming together, two resources, two beliefs that can make a huge difference. So my last comment, uh, this is not soft work. The, the people that we're talking about have incredible courage. This is not just, well, let's all be nice. This is, let's be tough. Let's show courage. Let's push into this deeper stuff. So there's a side of this that's incredibly assertive, incredibly insistent. And it is about spirit work. It is about collaboration. It has the good values. But it better be as tough as hell to carry the day. And I think that's where we are in this combination of things. And we see ingredients of this coming out. People respond to our book positively by saying, we want to do not only this, but more of this. This is a time to be pushy. And I want to be part of it. We, Mark and I do. All of the people we work with are ready to push, push, push for this agenda. Thank you, Michael and Mark. Thanks, everybody. This has been fantastic. Love your participation. Thank you very much.